So tonight I'll speak a bit about the uh, Vitaka Santana Sutta. So this is uh, one of the recorded discourses of the Buddha, uh, which I speak about from time to time. I haven't spoken about it in quite some time. So someone requested that I speak about it tonight. So here we go, speaking about it tonight. Uh, so Vitaka Santana uh, is translated here as the stilling of thought. So one of the major things that we're learning how to do in meditation practice is how to control our mind, uh, how to control our, our thinking process. Uh, so much of the time we're engaging in a tremendous amount of unnecessary thinking, uh, which can seem out of control. It can seem like there's not really anything we can do about it. But actually there is. Uh, there's quite a lot we can do about it. Uh, the mind mm, is a tool, and we can use it when we want to use it, and we can turn it off when we don't want to use it. So there's no need to think most of the time. When there's a need to think, then we think. When there's not a need to think, then it's usually better not to, to let the mind run away. Uh, also, much of the thinking that we engage in is just making us unhappy. Uh, it's agitating the mind, or it's, it's producing discontent, or it's producing irritation. Uh, so it's important not to let uh, our thoughts, uh, our habitual thought patterns, dominate us. It's important to get some control over our thought patterns, our thought processes. And to some degree, this happens automatically just in the course of uh, practicing concentration. Uh, so when focusing the mind on a particular meditation object, uh, so for example, mindfulness of the body, which is the main method that I was teaching during the meditation period, focusing on the sensations of your body. Just by placing your attention there, uh, then the, the thinking of the mind will naturally diminish a little bit. And actually, if you focus entirely on the body, then the, the thinking in the mind will disappear entirely. Uh, you can only do one thing at a time. So when you put all of your attention on one thing, then there's no space to do anything else. If 100% of your mind is focused on feeling your body, then you actually won't engage in any thinking. Uh, but that's a fairly advanced level of concentration. Uh, for those who are familiar with Buddhist technical terms, that's what we call jhana. Uh, so when the mind is, is completely engaged with the meditation object to the point where it's not uh, doing anything else. Uh, so most of us in an ordinary period of meditation, when we're not uh, in a meditation retreat, um, but just on day-to-day -day meditation, we're not likely to get that depth of direct concentration. So it's important to develop some skills uh, some ways of, of controlling the mind. Uh, so this discourse, the Vitaka Santana Sutta, the discourse on stilling thought, gives five very practical ways of uh, starting to get some control over the thinking process. So I'll read through the sutta, and every now and then I'll stop and give some explanation about what the Buddha is talking about and how it, how it relates, how we can use it. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions. Uh, so this is from the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, and it's sutra number 20. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One, that's the Buddha, the Buddha is called the Blessed One, on one occasion the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati, at Jeta's Grove, in Anattapindika's park. There the Blessed One addressed the monks. Monks! Auspicious sir, those monks replied to the Blessed One. The Blessed One said this. So this is a standard opening to a sutta. The Buddha was talking to monks, as most of the suttas are the Buddha talking to a group of monks. Um, but that doesn't mean his advice only applies to monks. His advice applies to anyone who is sincerely interested in attaining enlightenment. Sometimes when people read the suttas, they think, oh, well, I don't really need to pay attention to this and that because it's only for monks. But that's not true. Uh, if you want to attain enlightenment, listen to what the Buddha said. He, he's got a lot of very useful things to say on the subject. So the Buddha says, Monks, 
There are five objects of awareness to be given attention to from time to time by a monk who is committed to developing a heightened mind. What five? Uh, so that's the opening. So five, five ways of focusing the mind uh, when we're trying to develop uh, a heightened mind, when we're trying to, to become, to have a mind which is above average, which is uh, extraordinary, uh, a mind which is beyond the ordinary, mundane uh, mind of, of ordinary people. So we're trying to, to develop a, a super mundane mind, uh, a mind which is uh, far beyond the ordinary, distracted, confused, disturbed, uh, unsatisfied minds that, that most people have. The heightened mind. So the Buddha uh, says, Here monks, when harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion arise in a monk due to a particular object of awareness, from paying attention to a particular object of awareness, then that monk is to shift his attention from that object of awareness to another object of awareness that is connected with something wholesome. When he shifts his attention from that object of awareness to another object of awareness that is connected with something wholesome, those harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion are abandoned and they disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally still, settled, unified, and concentrated. So briefly, what the Buddha is uh, saying here is that uh, if we're mm, pointing our attention towards something, and while pointing our attention towards that, the mind is becoming full of desire, aversion, or delusion, so the three basic harmful qualities that we seek to overcome, well, just point your mind towards something else. Doesn't really sound that complicated, does it? Uh, so, for example, if you're thinking about your coworker uh, and you're getting irritated because your coworker did something upsetting yesterday, well, then just think about something else. Direct your mind towards something else that doesn't bring up uh, those thoughts of irritation or that feeling of irritation. Uh, or, for example, if you're, if you're practicing meditation and you're using one method, uh, and while you're using that method, you notice the mind is becoming very spacey and distracted, uh, well, then use something else. Uh, use a different method, something that's more grounded, something that gives you a better sense of, of connection uh, with the present moment, a better sense of connection with the, the physical world. Uh, and the Buddha gives a simile here. So with each one of the five methods, he gives a simile which helps to illustrate his point. Uh, he says, Just like a skilled carpenter or carpenter's apprentice strikes away, knocks out, and does away with a coarse peg using a refined peg. So the simile he's using here is uh, if you have a block of wood with a hole in it, uh, and uh, you've plugged that hole with, with maybe a, a rough, Mm, chunk of wood, uh, but then later on you craft a very nice, smooth, perfectly fitting piece of wood. Then you can put the new piece of wood on top of the old one and just tap it with your hammer, and the old one will be knocked away and the new one will fit in place. So it's like that. Uh, when we're doing something with our mind that's producing a lot of unwholesome activity or unwholesome feelings in the mind, uh, then we just replace that with something wholesome. Uh, one of the common examples that's given is that uh, if the mind is, is filled with aversion, uh, then to practice loving-kindness meditation. So replacing that uh, irritable, annoyed state of mind with a state of mm, uh, warmth, benevolence, kindness, gentleness. Uh, but this, this really applies to anything. So when we're engaged in any kind of mental activity, and we notice that that mental activity is producing more desire, more irritation, more confusion, then whatever that is, we need to stop. And we need to do something else with the mind. Uh, so optimally, we replace it with something wholesome. So for example, instead of thinking about your irritating coworker, you might think about, well, you might think about the Buddha, if you're Buddhist, um, recommended. Uh, or you might, uh, actually you might bring to mind perhaps your cat uh, and you feel that sense of, of kindness and, and a warm-heartedness towards your cat. Uh, or 
or focus on your body. Uh, practice equanimity. Um, develop that, that stable, peaceful state of mind uh, just by holding attention on your body. Uh, so we're seeking to replace any kind of unwholesome activity with something wholesome. Mm. So the second simile he gives, the Buddha says, Monks, when that monk shifts his attention from that object of awareness to another object of awareness that is connected with something wholesome, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, then that monk is to consider the disadvantages of those thoughts thinking. These thoughts are unwholesome. These thoughts are blameworthy. These thoughts result in dissatisfaction. When he considers the disadvantages of those thoughts, those harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion are abandoned, and they disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally still, settled, unified, and concentrated. So this is the second method he gives. Uh, so if we try the first one and it's not working, uh, so we're trying to shift the mind from uh, an unwholesome course of thought to a, whole, a wholesome course of action. Uh, then what he recommends next is to uh, bring to mind the drawbacks of the unwholesome thoughts. Uh, remind ourselves that the thinking that we're engaging in is unwholesome. It's destructive. It's making us unhappy. Uh, and also it leads to us doing harmful things. So, for example, if we notice that we're getting caught up in irritation, uh, annoyance, anger, hatred, uh, any of these aversive states of mind, then we remind ourselves, uh, this is harmful. Uh, it leads to me doing harmful things to others, uh, but also it's immediately unpleasant. It immediately, right now, is disturbing my peace of mind. Right now, it's making me unhappy. This is not worth doing. This is not worth engaging in. Uh, so by reminding ourselves that what we're doing is, is making us unhappy, that it, it doesn't lead to our benefit, it only leads to our harm, uh, then you might find that just naturally you start to let go of it. Naturally you start to release it. Uh, so uh, also if the mind is, is getting wrapped up with desire, so this is quite common. Maybe you're walking down the street and you see something in a store window and you're like, oh, I really want that. Uh, or you see someone that you're attracted to and, and you start, uh, and you have some feeling of desire arising. Uh, or you hear about a movie that's coming out and you're like, oh, I really want to see that. That sounds great. Or whatever it is. Uh, again, remind yourself, this feeling is already unpleasant. Just take a moment to stop and look at the feeling of desire when the mind is wrapped up in, in craving and obsession. Uh, take a moment to stop and look at how, how uncomfortable it is to be filled with desire. It's not a pleasant experience at all. Uh, so we tend to fixate on what we think is going to be pleasant when we get whatever we want. Uh, and we miss how unpleasant it is to be filled with wanting. We miss how unpleasant it is to be filled with desire. So noticing how unpleasant it is and also reflecting that when we're filled with desire, then we tend to do inadvisable things. Uh, we make advances on people who perhaps aren't so interested or in, in situations where it's not appropriate. Uh, or we buy things that, that we don't really need or, or maybe that we, we can't really afford or, or that we're just going to throw away in a little while. Uh, and, and actually greed is, is what leads to uh, all the terrible things that are happening in the world these days. So this uh, rapacious misuse of the environment is all coming from greed. Uh, and that leads to incredible harm to, to a large number of beings. Uh, so reflecting on the drawbacks of, of greed and, and aversion when they arise. And also when we notice spaciness or delusion or distractibility in the mind. Uh, when we notice agitation in the mind. When we notice uh, dullness in the mind. Also recollecting that these two are unwholesome states of mind uh, because they prevent us from clearly seeing and understanding our experience. Uh, so we don't want to engage in any kind of mental activity that generates agitation or confusion or disturbance. And we also don't want to nourish uh, any kind of spaciness or dullness. 
So keeping the mind alert but peaceful, uh, cultivating that, that internal and external stability. And uh, of course the Buddha gives a simile. Uh, this one is a bit more fun than the last one. He says, just like a young woman or young man who is naturally fond of adornments would be upset, humiliated, and disgusted uh, if the corpse of a snake, a dog, or a human was tied to their neck. In the same way, monks, when that monk shifts his attention from that object of awareness to another object of awareness that is connected with something wholesome, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, then that monk is to consider the disadvantages of those thoughts thinking, these thoughts are unwholesome, these thoughts are blameworthy, these thoughts result in dissatisfaction. When he considers the disadvantages of those thoughts, those harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion are abandoned, and they disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally still, settled, unified, and concentrated. Anybody want some dead bodies tied around your neck? Anyone? No? Well, that's what it's like. Uh, when the mind is filled with craving, you just stop and you look at it and you're like, wow, that is disgusting. That is horrific. I don't want that disgusting thing in my mind. Or when the mind is filled with aversion, uh, it's just like, wow, how vile, how poisonous. Uh, I don't want that in my mind either. Uh, but also when the mind is filled with distraction uh, or spaciness or agitation, it's like, wow, that's also really mixing things up. That's causing a lot of trouble. Uh, it causes me to be very uh, internally uh, disturbed, uh, disturbs my own peace of mind, and, and also it's upsetting to others as well. Uh, so we see the harmfulness uh, of these, these states of mind. And then naturally, uh, we, again, we start to pull back from them. Just as if you suddenly look down and you see you have a dead snake around your neck, then probably the first thing you would do is take it off. Uh, you wouldn't just walk around all day like, oh, check out my dead snake. Uh, maybe if you're a little boy, you would. Uh, but most of us, we would just be like, oh, this is really, really disgusting. I don't want this on me. Uh, it's the same. When we see these unwholesome thoughts in the mind, uh, first thing is recognizing the thoughts are not who we are. Thoughts are just things that come and go. They don't, they don't belong to us. They don't identify us. Um, they're just things that come and go. They're impermanent. They're subject to change. So if an angry thought appears, that does not mean you're an angry person. It just means that there's some disgusting thing in your mind which you might want to get rid of. So we get rid of it. It's kind of like if you're, if you're preparing a salad and, and you're going through and you notice that one of the tomatoes is moldy, uh, you throw it out. You don't put that in the salad. That would, that would just be disgusting and harmful. So it's the same. When you're going through the mind, when you see greed, desire, uh, anger, hatred, aversion, delusion, spaciness, agitation, when you see any of these things, you're just like, oh, I don't want that in there. That's harmful. So you throw it out. Mm. So then he moves on to the next one. Monks, when that monk is considering the disadvantages of those thoughts, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, then that monk is to ignore those thoughts and pay no attention to them. When he ignores those thoughts and pays no attention to them, those harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion are abandoned, and they disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally still, settled, unified, and concentrated. Monks, just like a person with eyes, who wants to stop seeing objects that have come into his field of view, might close his eyes or look away. In the same way, monks, when that monk is considering the disadvantages of those thoughts, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, they are abandoned and they disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally still, settled, unified, and concentrated. So this method, uh, it's much more difficult than it sounds. Uh, but if you can do it, this is the most direct. Uh, so when some harmful course of activity arises, just stop. These things only persist when we fuel them. When you stop fueling them, they go away. It's really as simple as that. 
So you're sitting there thinking about how much you hate your coworker. Well, just stop thinking about your coworker. Bam, problem gone. You don't need to do anything else. Just stop. So part of the problem is that we tell ourselves lies like, I can't stop thinking about this. That's a lie. Of course you can stop thinking about it. You just don't want to. So just stop thinking about it. Uh, so the simile he gives is very simple. He says it's like closing your eyes or looking away. If you don't want to see something, then just don't look at it. I know, the Buddha is really funny sometimes. But he has a, this very subtle, dry sense of humor. Uh, and actually runs all through the Pali Canon. Like the Buddha's always, I almost get this feeling like he always has this little half smile where like he feels like he's the only one who gets the joke, but he tells it anyway. I, I get that with a lot of the suttas. Um, but yeah, it's, it's watching your mind. Uh, and as we watch our minds, then we start to become aware of all the mental activity that we're doing. Uh, and we start to realize that we actually do have the ability to stop. Uh, it's only when we don't pay attention to our own mind that it seems to be out of control. Uh, but when we look at it, then we realize, oh, I'm the one who's doing this. I'm the one who's making all this noise in here. Which means I can stop making all this noise in here. Uh, so this is a very direct method, which if you can do it, it's the best. Because it doesn't create any extra noise in the mind. It's very direct. Uh, the next one he gives. Uh, when that monk is ignoring those thoughts and paying no attention to them, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, then monks, that monk is to pay attention to the stilling of the production of those thoughts. And he'll explain this in a moment, so be patient. When he pays attention to the stilling of the production of those thoughts, those harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion are abandoned, and they disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally still, settled, unified, and concentrated. Just like a person who is walking quickly might think, why do I walk quickly? Perhaps I should walk slowly. So he walks slowly. He might think, why do I walk slowly? Perhaps I should stand still. So he stands still. He might think, why am I standing? Perhaps I should sit down. So he sits down. He might think, why am I sitting? Perhaps I should lay down. So he lays down. In this way, monks, a person replaces coarse postures with refined postures. In the same way, monks, when that monk is ignoring those thoughts and paying no attention to them, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, they are abandoned and they disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally still, settled, unified, and concentrated. So the way I take this is it's about slowing down. Uh, so when you notice you're engaging in some kind of harmful mental activity and you feel like you just can't stop it using any of the other methods, well, don't try to stop it, but instead try to slow it down a little bit. Try to dial down the intensity. Uh, so instead of like sheer blinding rage, try to dial that down just to ordinary burning anger. Uh, or if you're at the stage of burning anger, try to dial it down just to irritation. Uh, so it's, it's about reducing the intensity of the activity that we're engaging in. So this is more of a harm reduction uh, strategy. Uh, so rather than just going to an immediate full stop, it's more of a deceleration. So gradually slowing down the unwholesome activities of the mind. Uh, one way that you can do this, uh, which has to be done carefully, because if you're not careful, you can make things worse. Um, when you notice the harmful thoughts in the mind, uh, take control of them. Uh, so like you notice this thought like, I hate John, I hate John. Go ahead and jump on it. Like actually start actively thinking, I hate John, I hate John. And then start putting a little pause between each one. I hate John. I hate John. I hate John. And after a while, you'll just stop naturally. Actually, after a while, it'll start to seem like the most absurd thing. You'll start to realize what an incredibly ridiculous thing you're doing. 
and you'll stop naturally. But also you'll start to notice that those gaps between the words are vast, spacious, and peaceful. And the mind will naturally start to want to spend more and more time in that space. It's actually the same during the meditation. I recommend it if the mind is very distracted to repeat focus, focus, focus. Uh, it's the same. You'll start to notice the peacefulness between the words. And the mind will naturally start to want to inhabit that space of peacefulness between the words. So this is the, the practice of reducing uh, the unwholesome thoughts. So reducing their intensity, reducing their frequency, uh, reducing their potency, trying to just dial it down uh, however slowly or quickly you need to. Um, then the Buddha gives uh, the final method. So this is the fifth one. This is not the most recommended one, but it, it is an option. When that monk is paying attention to the stilling of the production of those thoughts, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, then that monk is to clench his teeth, press his tongue against the roof of his mouth, and mentally restrain, subdue, and overpower the mind. When he clenches his teeth, presses his tongue against the roof of his mouth, and mentally restrains, subdues, and overpowers the mind, those harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion are abandoned, and they disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally still, settled, unified, and concentrated. Monks, just like a strong man might grab a weaker man's head, neck, or shoulder, and restrain, subdue, and overpower him, in the same way, monks, when that monk is paying attention to the stilling of the production of those thoughts, if harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion still arise, then that monk is to clench his teeth, press his tongue against the roof of his mouth, and mentally restrain, subdue, and overpower the mind. Uh, so, there's a number of ways of practicing this. Uh, one of the most direct ways, which is not terribly harmful, uh, is to pick a, a word or a phrase uh, or a mantra, if you like such things, uh, and just repeat it as quickly and intensely as you can in your mind. So just trying to just force everything else out of the mind, just by like devoting all of your effort into the repetition of, of this, this mantra, repetition of this word or phrase. Uh, and with this method, it doesn't actually really matter what it is. Uh, it's just anything. Uh, anything other than the harmful activity. So I like the word focus uh, because it carries a, a very direct meaning and it's short. Uh, you might like something a bit longer. Uh, optimally, again, something with a peaceful or wholesome tone is recommended. But you just keep repeating it over and over and over again. Uh, just pushing everything else out of the mind. Uh, as, as forcefully as possible. So, the Buddha continues, uh, When harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion arise in a monk due to a particular object of awareness, from paying attention to a particular object of awareness, then when that monk shifts his attention from that object of awareness to another that is connected with something wholesome, or when he considers the disadvantages of those thoughts, or when he ignores those thoughts and pays no attention to them, or when he pays attention to the stilling of the production of those thoughts, or when he clenches his teeth, presses his tongue against the roof of his mouth, and mentally restrains, subdues, and overpowers the mind, those harmful, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion are abandoned, and they disappear. From their abandoning, the mind becomes internally still, settled, unified, and concentrated. So he's just briefly listing the five methods again. Monks, this is called a monk who is in control of all of his patterns of thought. He will think whatever thought he wishes to think. He will not think whatever thought he does not wish to think. So again, the Buddha is emphasizing here, we actually do have the power to think what we want to and not think what we don't want to. With training and effort, we can get full control of our own mind. And he goes on to say, Craving has been severed, the fetters have been removed, and through the appropriate understanding of conceit, dissatisfaction has been eliminated. So what he's pointing to here is that when we're in full control of our thinking process, 
then that means that we can cut off the process of craving. We can cut off the process of desire and obsession, uh, which is at the root uh, of all of our discontent. It's at the root of all of our unhappiness and confusion. Uh, and we can also understand how our thought processes are constantly uh, reifying, constantly strengthening and building up our, our self-attachment. Uh, so as we get control of our thought patterns, then that conceit, uh, that constant obsession with me uh, starts to fade away. One of the very clear examples of this is uh, when you start to look at your thought patterns, you start to recognize that about 99% of them are about yourself. Uh, I call it the endless saga of me. We're constantly telling ourselves the saga of me. I got up this morning, and I looked at my phone, and I didn't like the text messages, and then somebody texted me, and then I had to go to work, and then this, and then I did that, and then this happened to me, and then mine, and then me, and I, and me, and mine. This endless story of me. So once we start to get some control over our thought processes, that endless story starts to disappear. And in its space, we find this deep bedrock sense of contentment, the sense of peacefulness and serenity, uh, the sense of, of unconditional bliss, uh, which is present when we're not so obsessed with ourselves. Uh, and ultimately, uh, all Buddhist practice is aimed at overcoming self-attachment, because self-attachment, uh, so we say craving is the root of, of all suffering, the, the root of all discontent, but the root of craving is self-centeredness. So if we eliminate self-centeredness, that eliminates all of our unhappiness in one stroke, completely wipes out the whole problem. So it ends, this is what the Blessed One said, satisfied those monks delighted in the Blessed One's speech. So that's the end of the sutta. Uh, at this time we have a few more minutes if there's any questions or comments. Yes, go ahead. I have a question about delusion. The other two seem more like clear. Mm. But um, it feels like the nature of it means that we're not always able to easily parse out what is mm. a delusion. Yeah. Yeah, delusion is by far the most difficult to deal with. Uh, so the Buddha, in one sutta, the Buddha says that greed is not very blameworthy, uh, but it's hard to remove. Um, anger is very blameworthy, but it's easy to remove. Delusion is very blameworthy and very hard to remove. Uh, so. This is true. The other two are much easier to work with because they're much more obvious. They're much more blatant. And the remedies are very direct. Uh, so if you have a lot of aversion, then uh, do loving kindness, practice acts of kindness and compassion, cultivate a mind of, of gentleness, thoughtfulness, consideration, caring. Uh, and within a couple years, you'll notice that your mind is mostly free of aversion. There's still some, some deep set habits which will take a lot longer to clean out, but you can get rid of about 90% of the problem with a very simple direct method. Similarly with greed, uh, there's fairly direct ways of, of clearing the mind of greed, uh, contemplating the drawbacks of sensuality, cultivating contentment, and so on. Uh, delusion is much more difficult, uh, and the main reason it's difficult is because we are deeply immersed in our own delusions to the point where we don't see them. We think this is just the way the world is. Of course, this is the way the world is. But actually, this is the way we see the world. You go around with red glasses and you think the world is red. Uh, so there's a few things you can do about delusion. One thing which makes a huge difference, actually, is reading the suttas. Uh, because you start to get a sense as to how an enlightened being sees the world, how they feel the world, how they think about the world. Uh, and you start to recognize that our own thoughts are a little bit different. Um, so you start to get, get some senses to that disconnect between your own mind and the mind of an enlightened being. 
another thing that makes a big difference is going to uh, well-developed practitioners, so monks and nuns who've been practicing for many, many, many years, and ask them questions. Uh, and be very honest with them about your experience. Uh, and it is hard. Uh, but keep in mind that well-developed practitioners, they, they've already removed most, if not all, of their hostility, grudge-bearing, judgmentalism. Most of that's gone, if not all of it. Uh, so when you go to them and you talk about your craziness, then their only concern will be to help you. They're not going to, to do anything harmful. They're not going to mock you or think less of you. Uh, so that, that willingness to, to open up and to say, this is what's going on. Uh, what's your advice? What are your thoughts? And also ask questions. So as you read the suttas, as you practice more, then you'll have questions coming up, uncertainties and, and doubts and issues that, that don't quite make sense to you. Then you go and you ask. And you don't necessarily need to take everything on faith. In fact, it's not recommended uh, because some teachers will tell you things that are not correct. So you can't just believe whatever people tell you. Uh, but seriously consider. Again, especially if it's coming from a, a Buddhist monastic who's been practicing for many years. Uh, give some credence to what they say. Don't believe it automatically, but really think about it and consider it. Turn it over in your mind. Look in your own life and to see if it's true. Uh, so the way that we break through delusion is we come to an intellectual understanding of what the Buddha was talking about. And then we look for it in our lives. We look at our lives with genuine sincerity and see, is this true or not? Yeah. Then the delusion starts to fall away. And it doesn't usually fall away in big chunks. Usually it gradually melts, gradually dissolves over many, many, many years. Um, once in a rare while, a big chunk will all slough off at once, but not often, not often. Usually it's a gradual process. Uh, one big thing that helps a lot um, if your main issue is delusion, uh, mindfulness in the body. Everywhere you go, pay attention to your body. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, for each of the three types, so greed types, hate types, and delusion types, whichever one is your dominant issue, there's a primary recommendation. So delusion types are recommended to pay attention to their body, mindfulness of the body. Uh, any other questions? On, on that note, if uh, delusion is your biggest fault, is there a particular meditation style suited to that? Uh, yeah, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically what Buddhism is about. Buddhist practice is all about overcoming delusion. Because the root delusion is the delusion of self, the delusion of separate self-existence. That's the root delusion that we're aiming at. Uh, and then on top of that is the delusion that you can find happiness in getting what you want. And then on top of that is a whole mess of other delusions, like derived subsidiary secondary delusions. Yeah. yeah, so just as you progress with your practice, you'll start to clear out a lot of that mess. Uh, if you practice sincerely uh, and with an open mind, then you'll start to clear out a lot, of the, a lot of those secondary delusions. And then you'll start to see the root delusions more clearly. Uh, it's kind of like if, you, uh, like if you're trying to remove a bush, uh, then in the beginning you might just work on cutting away some of the outer branches. So you can see where the trunk is. Then you can go at the trunk with, with a, a shovel or a chainsaw or whatever and, and take the bush out completely. But in the beginning, you need to clear away the, the outer leaves and branches so you can see where the, where the trunk is. So it's like that with our practice. In the beginning, we're often just clearing away the outer 
mass, the outer delusions, before we can get at the root, at the heart of it. And remember also that greed and aversion arise from delusion. Uh, so as we work to clear out our surface level greed and aversion, that also weakens the core delusion a bit. Uh, we also start to see it more clearly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that style of practice is mostly for mm, stabilizing the mind, for developing mental, sti uh, mental stability, focus, um, alertness, uh, for developing some degree of, of physical awareness. Uh, so usually, after the mind is well stabilized, which can take a while, especially if you don't practice very much. Um, once you develop some degree of mental stability, then one starts practicing insight meditation when the mind is stable. Uh, and that's when we can start to break down some of the core issues of the mind. Uh, but you can't jump directly to it, usually, uh, because it's not very effective if the mind is not stable. Well, first off, recognize that you are not unique. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you are not a unique snowflake. Sorry. Uh, you're basically exactly the same as everybody else in the entire universe, the whole multiverse. Basically everyone. We're all the same. The details vary. But actually, those details are constantly changing. Uh, so whatever you think is special to you is subject to change. Uh, so a direct way of, of starting to get a sense of this is look at your habits and preferences and compare them to what they were like 10, 20, 30 years ago. And you'll probably see that some things have changed. Maybe a lot of things have changed. In my case, I'm a completely different person than I was 20 years ago. There's very little, very little in common. Let's say 21 years ago. Very little in common with that person. Some things, very little. Uh, and also the body. The body is also constantly changing. Uh, so I used to have perfect fingernails and toenails, but now one of my toenails is, is cracked, and the crack has never healed properly. So now I have the, the horror of looking at my toenails and realizing that the body is impermanent. It's subject to change. So it's a small thing. But those small things remind us that we are not our toenails, we are not our thoughts, we are not our preferences. We are not our emotions. These are just things that come and go. Uh, they arise based upon causes and conditions. They change. They disappear. Other things come. So whatever is currently in front of us, we call me. So this body is in front of me, so I call it me. It's the object that's closest to the mind, so I call it me. And also in the mind, there's a bunch of things that are close thoughts and emotions and preferences and so on. And so we call that me. But actually, that's not who we are. Because you wait a moment and it changes. And actually, you can change any of it at any time. Uh, so, and, and also, as you look around at others, you see the same thing going on with everybody else. Uh, so you start to see that there's really nothing identifiably you. There's just a bunch of things shifting and changing all the time. Uh, and it's not random. It's, it's shifting and changing based on cause and effect. Uh, and also, we do have volition. We do have the ability to make choices, which affects how things unfold to some extent. Uh, but ultimately, nothing is permanently, eternally who we are. Uh, so we can start to take a lighter grip on things, a lighter attitude. 
uh, it brings up an incredible sense of joy, lightness, and freedom when we stop taking ourselves so seriously. We start to, to drop this, this whole obsession with me and mine, and I'm so special, and I'm unique, and I suffer more than everybody else, or I'm better than everybody else, or I'm worse than everybody else, or I'm equal to everybody else. Like all these, these ridiculous stories, uh, they just make us unhappy. They don't make life any better. They just make life worse. Uh, so when you drop it, there's this tremendous sense of spaciousness and joy that you find. It's been here all along. Uh, we just haven't been looking at it uh, because we were too busy talking about ourselves, too busy talking to ourselves about ourselves, which is so ridiculous. It's ludicrous. It's absurd. We're always talking to ourselves about ourselves. It's just crazy. Like, why do we do this? Uh, we do it because we're crazy, actually. Uh, so Buddhist practice, actually, in the, in the, first, the early stages of Buddhist practice is recognizing that you're crazy. But everybody else is, too. But the only people who aren't crazy are the ones who are enlightened. So that's what we're aiming at. We're aiming at genuine sanity. And one of the aspects of genuine sanity is recognizing that there is absolutely nothing whatsoever which is ultimately, permanently you. Whatever you think you are is subject to change. Therefore, it's not you. So when we start to take this attitude, then all these little details of our lives, they start to seem pretty petty and unimportant. Start to realize it actually doesn't really matter so much. And, and you, you get a lightness uh, in how you deal with it. So you still make decisions. If your boyfriend's a jerk, then break up with him. If you hate your job, find a different one, and so on. Um, if you want to become a monastic, I can tell you some monasteries, and so on. So uh, we, we still have that willingness to make, um, to make important decisions. Uh, but we do so with, without the anxiety uh, or the obsessive mind. Uh, we, we take this a much more lighthearted attitude to it all. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. It's particularly the anxiety and obsessive mind part. Yeah. Because we're making decisions. So, yeah. Because I can think it's, it's kind of like the obsessive, you're talking about like talking about yourself to yourself, or it's talking about how many things I want to change in my life, but it's just like putting <coughs> Another reflection that I find really useful, uh, so in Buddhism we say that we've all lived countless lives before this one, innumerable lives. And over the course of those countless lives, we have had every imaginable experience. The only thing we've never experienced is enlightenment, but we've experienced everything else. So whatever it is you think you want to do with your life, you've already done it. Didn't make you happy, by the way. Uh, which is why here you are again, still trying to pursue happiness some other way. Uh, so it, it can give some lightness. Like, like people have this idea of, of like the bucket list. Like these are the things I want to do before I die. It doesn't matter. You've already done all of it. It's like I want to climb Mount Everest. You've done that countless times. In fact, you died on Mount Everest countless times. Who cares? Uh, what's the next? Uh, you just go down the list and you're like, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. And you start to realize that the only thing that really matters is getting control of this totally insane mind that's been making you so miserable your whole life. That's the most important thing. Everything else is secondary. Okay? Yeah. Question about anger and what practice can help you be aware of your angry anger. Well, the, root, uh, the, the most commonly recommended practice for any of the aversion mind states is loving-kindness meditation. Uh, so there's many ways of doing loving-kindness meditation. Uh, the simplest way is to uh, just wish, may everyone be happy. And you just keep rolling that thought in your mind over and over. May everyone be happy, may everyone be happy. Uh, and really try to mean it. Try to bring up that feeling of limitless, unconditional goodwill. 
limitless, unconditional love, gentleness, kindness, benevolence towards all beings with no exception. Uh, and the mind starts to change. Um, if that's too much of a step to just go directly to that, that's actually usually given as the last step in the meditation. There's a number of progressive methods which build up to that as the final step. So I usually recommend as a first step, you just pick one person who you already care about quite a bit. Um, so it might be your cat or your mother or it might be your best friend or uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, as long as it's someone who when you think of them, your heart melts a little bit and you're just like, oh, buddy. So for me, it's my cat, nothing else works. Um, so you start with that, and with that one person, you just start wishing, may they be happy, may they be happy. And you just start to feel, oh, that's what it's like. That's what it's like to have a gentle, loving mind instead of an angry, hating mind. And you focus on building up that loving, gentle mind. Uh, and you just focus on it until you start to forget about the people. And just that mind state of gentle, loving kindness becomes the most important thing. You keep magnifying it and building up and flooding your mind with it, and then you try to keep it all day long. So you do this as a meditation practice for 30 minutes or however long, and then you try to keep it all day long. And when people piss you off, then you just remind yourself, may everyone be happy, may everyone be happy. Let your eyes relax, let your face and forehead relax. Bring up a little smile, start thinking of your favorite person, start wishing, may everyone be happy. And you'll notice, you start to gentle again a little bit. Uh, and, and those angry thoughts start to fade away. So that's a really potent method. Uh, it works best as a vaccine rather than as a treatment. So you do it before the anger arises. And then it makes the anger less likely to appear and less intense if it does appear. Um, and uh, when the anger does appear, uh, as the Buddha recommends here, notice how unpleasant it is. Notice the drawbacks of it. Uh, we tend to fixate on our justifications for being angry. It's like, well, I should be angry. Well, maybe, maybe you do have a good reason to be angry. It doesn't change the fact that it's hurting you. And ultimately, we don't want to hurt. Ultimately, we want to be happy. So you recognize this anger is making me really miserable. It's making me really unhappy. Uh, it doesn't matter what reason I have to be angry. It's hurting me, so I want to stop. I want to drop this. So you cultivate that attitude, and, and you'll notice you start to pull back from it. Mm. Another thing that can help is if you're angry at a person, remember that they're delusional. Uh, and delusional people do crazy things. Uh, so we don't hate them uh, or get angry at them. We recognize that they're caught in suffering and confusion and misery, just as everybody else is, just as we are. So we want them to be free of that confusion, free of that misery, free of that dissatisfaction, free of that uh, mm, confusion. Mm. So then what comes up is compassion rather than anger. So compassion is another excellent remedy, uh, excellent treatment for a, a grumpy mind. Those are a few things you can work on. Okay. Okay. Anything else? We're running out of time, so maybe if there's one more question, we could take one more. Yeah. Uh, how do you protect your mind before like it explodes? Like, Constant self-awareness. Are you angry right now? No. Good. <laughs> And just keep watching your mind. Uh, and when you notice it, usually it builds. Very rarely do you go from totally calm to utterly furious. Very rarely. Usually you're here and then something happens and you're like, WTF. And then it starts building and building and building. So you notice and the moment that first little like, ugh, starts to appear, then you're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want to go in that direction. I don't want to go that way. Uh, and this can happen very quickly, but if your self-awareness is strong, then units of time start to lose their importance. 
So whether it's a one second or a tenth of a second or a hundredth of a second or a thousandth of a second, if your mindfulness is strong, you'll catch it the moment it appears and you'll know it for what it is and you will pull back from it and it will die right there. Okay? So I think 